Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Mark Gallarducci, and the Governor Brown's Director of Emergency Services here at OES. Um, thank you for coming in. Uh, we're going to begin the um, briefing today on the update of the wildfire response. Um, we'll provide you the latest efforts across the state to assist those that have been impacted by this uh, very, very serious wildfire. And I, I just want to start off by reiterating that we are constantly thinking about and praying about those that have been impacted by this event and those that have lost uh, their homes. We know it's a extremely stressful and challenging time and uh, we are uh, all hands on deck and doing everything we can to continue to support our local authorities and the communities to get through this, this process. Um, we're running, running a 24 seven operation here at the State Operations Center. We've got close to five thousand people deployed uh, uh, in supporting our local authorities in the various fires um, and uh, we have we are working and, and, and reaching out and have reached out to our neighboring states for additional support uh, which we'll go over in the briefings in a minute here uh, which outlines all the various agencies and departments um, that have uh, contributed to uh, the, the uh, firefight uh, so what we'll do is as we do in our typical fashion we'll begin the briefing by having each of the various agencies that are leading certain parts of this give the brief. We'll start off with uh, Chief Ken Pemlaw, the director of the CAL FIRE, our California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, and I, I just want to reiterate, and we've, this is what we've said every morning, uh, all week since this began. Uh, we're not out of the woods, and we're not going to be out of the woods for a long, a number of days, for a, a great number of days to come. Uh, the weather conditions that surfaced uh, Sunday evening uh, continue to plague the state. Uh, while we yesterday had a brief respite from uh, the winds, uh, we uh, have returned today to red flag conditions, uh, very dry humidities, 8% uh, in many locations, uh, and winds that are surfacing out of the north uh, in some places 40 miles an hour. But even yesterday without wind, these fires were driven by the critically dry fuel bed. Uh, we are still impacted by five years of drought. With the significant rain that we had last winter, th those effects are gone of that moisture, and we are literally looking at explosive vegetation. These fires are burning actively during the day and at night when one would expect a fire uh, to subside. Uh, and make no mistake, this is a serious, critical, catastrophic event. We have over 22 fires, major fires, burning in California, primarily in eight counties here in Northern California uh, this morning. Over 170,000 acres has burned since the beginning uh, of this event just a few days ago. And what's challenging about this is that it, these fires aren't just in the backwoods or out in the, in, in the wildlands or the forests in the state. These fires are burning in and around through developed communities. Uh, city of Santa Rosa, very classic example of the kinds of challenges we're facing in these firefights. Developed areas, uh, a mile or two outside or within uh, communities uh, away from the wildlands, uh, box stores, uh, uh, buildings, hotels, homes, all of it. Uh, these are the kinds of challenges because all of these areas not only have this infrastructure but have people, lots of people that we are dedicated to protect and that's our first priority is the protection of life and property. And that's what we have been focusing on uh, every day and will continue to focus on as our priority uh, from the beginning uh, of this event. Uh, so here's where we're at uh, this morning. Uh, very active fires uh, all night. Uh, as I indicated, 170,000 acres. Uh, unfortunately, just moments ago, we updated the count of fatalities associated with these fires. It's now at 21. Uh, and again, this is continuing to evaluate and adjudicate uh, the missing persons or unaccounted for uh, individuals. We continue to work on that as we get into some of these fire areas. But I'm going to tell everybody straight up, the potential continues to exist for, for peril if folks don't get out uh, from in front of these fires. And so please pay very close attention to evacuation orders. It's very dynamic. These fires are changing by the minute in many areas. Uh, information is going out via social media. Uh, via local uh, Del Redor contact. We literally had law enforcement officers and firefighters uh, yesterday afternoon 
uh, in Solano County going door to door, pulling people out of their homes ahead of the, uh, the Atlas fire. So again, very serious. Uh, just a quick update, uh, and again, uh, more information is available uh, locally uh, on these fires, but for example, uh, this morning, uh, the uh, Atlas fire in Napa, now Solano County, uh, is over 42,000 acres. Uh, the, the Tubbs fire uh, in Santa Rosa uh, is um, about um, 25,000 acres. And these numbers are very fluid, and they're going to change uh, throughout the day as these fires grow. Uh, we initiated additional evacuation orders early this morning uh, for uh, portions of the community of Calistoga. Uh, also looking at uh, an evacuation advisory for uh, the town of Middletown in Lake County uh, to the north. Uh, we're concerned uh, and anticipate that before the day is over, several of these fires uh, will merge uh, into one fire. Uh, literally, if you looked at the Napa Valley, uh, we have fire on the ridge line to the east of town and to the west of town and, and to the north. So uh, a great deal of fire uh, across all of these landscapes. Fires are well organized. As I said yesterday, uh, we have four incident management teams organized to bring all of these fires uh, under an organization. Uh, we spent over an hour speaking to each one of those four incident commanders this morning uh, to determine what were their critical challenges, what do they need, what do we as the state, local, and, and our federal partners need to do to support them uh, to get what they need? Uh, I can tell you right now across all of these incidents, we have 73 helicopters committed to this firefight. We have over 30 air tankers. We have over 550 fire engines just deployed uh, or immediately en route to these incidents. And uh, all totaled uh, close to 8,000 firefighters committed uh, to the firefight. That's just what we're doing right now uh, on the incidents. Uh, we are leaning very far forward. We're anticipating requests from the incidents. We're actually uh, ordering additional resources beyond what the fires are asking for so they get well ahead of this. I can tell you that uh, yesterday uh, ordered 170 fire engines from uh, neighboring states. Uh, Oregon, Nevada, Washington, and Arizona have all stepped up to the plate uh, and are sending resources upon our request. Uh, we are also working uh, through our federal partners to get additional fire resources from around the country. Uh, that includes uh, almost 60 additional firefighting hand crews, uh, an additional 150, 154 fire engines, uh, and an additional six uh, bulldozers. We are also rapidly uh, redeploying resources from uh, fires within California that are being contained and moving them into uh, these critical fires. The uh, Canyon 2 fire in Orange County is uh, 8,000 acres this morning, but the containment is coming up very rapidly. Uh, we are uh, rapidly releasing fire engines from that uh, incident and moving them into uh, Northern California. Uh, we are going very deep into our system and we're going very deep outside of the state uh, to get uh, these resources. Uh, Director Gallarducci uh, will also talk later about some of the other coordination efforts, but I can tell you, we're, uh, and as well as uh, uh, General Baldwin about the assets that the military is providing, but we're going very deep into the National Guard uh, and federal uh, military assets uh, here uh, in California. Uh, again, I want to reiterate we are leaning very far forward to get all of the resources uh, ahead of when the need, but understand we've got firefighters, law enforcement personnel, and others on the fire lines that have been out there for 72 hours. So our primary goal is to get these resources into the fires get these folks relief uh, and get firefighters on the ground uh, cutting perimeter line uh, and containing uh, these fires. We're going to keep folks uh, very well updated uh, throughout the course of, uh, of changing events, uh, but I also want to really directly address some of the concerns that have come up relative to uh, aircraft and air tankers and aviation assets. Uh, I indicated we've got over 73 helicopters and over 30 air tankers, airplanes fighting this fire. Uh, we have access to every available asset in the country as it relates to aviation assets. And those are all in here or coming. They're all being used. The incidents are getting everything they need. The challenge yesterday <laughs> is, as many saw, the smoke inversion literally pushed down across the ground and the aircraft could not only see, not see what was on the ground, they could not see each other flying in the air. Ineffective, couldn't work. And so they couldn't work in many areas. 
They still flew where they could. Today, a very different picture. Every one of the incident commanders indicated to us aircraft were already up and flying uh, when we were speaking to them early this morning. Uh, and so they continue a very aggressive aerial assault across all of the incidents based on the needs of those incidents today, and that will continue uh, for as long as we can continue uh, to fly and use them, and we will continue to do that. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to uh, Acting Commissioner of the California Highway Patrol, Warren Stanley. Thank you, Director Pinlot. As far as the CHP personnel, we have 112 personnel assigned to this event right now, mainly with traffic control, some general law enforcement in the, in the Santa Rosa area, dealing with, uh, with looters, and also general law enforcement, and also have a small contingent helping out at shelters. Uh, last night, we assisted uh, the National Guard and, and some, um, some people down in, uh, in the Napa Yountville area that needed to get to the uh, Yountville's Veterans Home. We gave them an escort and got them taken care of. Also, we assisted additional uh, 80 other people that needed to get to the hospital. We have uh, the assets we need. Uh, if we need more to, help to assist with evacuations, uh, we'll coordinate that with uh, Director Giladucci and provide those services. And also, the other assets we have is, is our rescue helicopters. I don't know if many of you know this, but on, on Sunday night into early Monday morning, uh, two of our CHP helicopters, one based out of the uh, Napa Airport and one based out of Redding, between those two helicopters and those crews, they rescued uh, 44 people, five dogs, and two cats. And um, we were very helpful to, and thankful to get those people uh, to safety. And uh, we look forward to continuing to work with our, our, our partners here and, and address this uh, very catastrophic fire. Thank you. I'm Major General Dave Baldwin with the California National Guard. We currently have 700 soldiers and airmen on duty supporting both firefighting efforts as well as consequence management that comes with the evacuation of the people and assisting their um, care and shelter. We're mobilizing an additional 1,800 soldiers and airmen today that will be available for duty um, later today and tomorrow. That includes the entire 49th Military Police Brigade, which is based in Northern California, that is deploying military police and engineer assets to the affected area. We've mobilized 13 Type 1 firefighting helicopters, in addition to two medical evacuation helicopters and two light observation helicopters. We're in coordination with the Nevada and Oregon National Guard to bring in additional helicopters if necessary. And we've also begun coordination with the United States Navy and the United States Marine Corps to bring in any fire suppression capable aircraft and crews that they have uh, either into Northern California or to fight fires in Southern California. We're also flying two MQ-9 Reaper unmanned aerial platforms that are providing fire mapping services to CAL FIRE as well as damage assessments to the local jurisdictions and to FEMA. We've deployed four communication systems to be able to provide telephone services in areas where cell phone service is out, including one system from the Nevada National Guard. We are also providing uh, linguistic support to evacuated areas for those uh, areas where um, evacuated personnel do not speak English or have difficulty with that language. Um, we are continuing to um, work very closely with CAL FIRE and the sheriffs in all of the affected counties, and we're prepared to deploy more resources from either the National Guard of California, the surrounding states, or the federal military if necessary. And I'll be followed by uh, Mr. Bob Fenton, who's the uh, regional administrator for FEDMA Region 9. Thank you, General. On uh, Monday, uh, Governor Brown uh, requested a declaration from the President. Tuesday morning, the President uh, declared a major declaration for California. In addition to the 10 fire management grants uh, we issued uh, uh, Sunday night through Monday morning, uh, that declaration authorizes me to coordinate uh, the federal government's activities in support of the state and local governments. Uh, as you heard from previous speakers to this point, it includes Resources to help uh, fight the fire. Uh, in addition to that, we are uh, providing resources to help with the sheltering, such as commodities uh, and other resources. Today, uh, my focus is uh, to uh, further assessments to turn on additional uh, programs from the federal government that will be able to help individuals uh, that uh, with uh, the recovery from these events. So that's our focus. With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Director Giladucci from the State of California Office of Emergency Services. Thanks, Bob. Okay, so um, you've got kind of an overview. Uh, let me uh, reiterate that all hands are on deck. 
uh, uh, in this particular situation. Uh, we will continue 24-7 operations uh, until the situation is mitigated. We are receiving huge amounts of resource support from our local governments and other mutual aid assets from the Mexican border to the Oregon border and beyond. Uh, we have over 330 law enforcement personnel uh, um, committed in, in supporting our local authorities. And in the shelters, uh, which the populations are currently about 4,400, um, in support of those shelters, we have, we have already distributed over 40,000 meals, 60,000 liters of water. Um, that's my list here. 60,000 liters of water, um, over uh, almost 2,000 uh, bariatric uh, special cots, ADA compliance, 12,000 blankets and sheets, and 100,000 um, uh, N95 masks. Uh, these are being commodities that are being distributed to points of distribution to support uh, the counties and, and their operations. Um, Administrator Fenton mentioned the the support from the federal government, which has been outstanding and very appreciative. That's helping us uh, move forward. In addition, cell sites have been a big question and a concern. Uh, at, at the height, of, there was roughly 77 major cell sites that were down, damaged, or burnt. Uh, I'm happy to report this morning uh, that 64 of those 77 have been restored, and we're beginning to, to get cell coverage back into some of the areas. Uh, particularly in downtown Napa and in uh, some of this, the uh, areas around the shelters in Sonoma County. Um, as well, the fiber lines have been uh, repaired enough that uh, they could actually do some workarounds and be able to start moving data through those lines. Um, power, uh, still roughly about 50,000 individuals without power throughout all of the complex fires. Uh, they are working on, uh, on trying to restore that downtown Napa was restored and, and, and highly, high, a number of parts of Sonoma as well. And they also are trying to get gas turned on back uh, in the areas they can today. I mean, the, the, there was areas where gas was turned off. They have to go back in and, and reset pilot lights. And that is a, a major uh, effort of PG&E and the other utilities that are gonna be uh, doing that today. Lastly, our private sector partners have been tremendous. We've had tremendous commodities support, Raley's, Walmart, Target, um, uh, California Grocers Association, uh, uh, Google, Facebook, these have all come together and coordinated here through the State Operations Center uh, to provide, uh, whether it's funding or uh, personnel support or technical support or commodities, all of them have been very, very appreciative, appreciated and are part of this overall effort. We will continue this pace. We will continue to support this until this situation uh, is mitigated and we are getting those communities back up online again. So with that, at this point, I'll turn it over to our governor, uh, Governor Evan Brown. Thank you. Well, you've heard, heard the story here, the profoundly serious fire. We've had uh, big fires in the past. This is one of the biggest, the most serious, and it's not over. Uh, just the recitation of all the manpower and and uh, resources, it's a lot. And it has to be a lot because we have people living in communities and cities in very developed situations that are connected to and very close to forests and uh, brush and all the rest of it that becomes kindling. So uh, that's the way it is uh, with a warming climate and dry weather and reducing moisture. Uh, these kind of catastrophes have happened, they'll continue to happen, and we have to be prepared to do everything we can uh, to mitigate. Uh, it's gonna cost a lot of money. The president has declared uh, disaster, major disaster, uh, and along with the other ones in Texas and Florida and uh, elsewhere, uh, this will be tens of billions. So we gotta get ready uh, to deal with this situation and then prepare uh, for others that will follow in the years to come. Uh, and we'll, they can answer any of your questions about the details. I mentioned the whole country. To, okay. I think there's a $30 billion appropriation that will, will probably grow, it will have to grow. Um, does California have enough in the reserve fund to pay for this? Well, I think we have enough, but the federal government's going to help us um, as they're helping the other states. It's just uh, part of the facts of a highly developed uh, society is that 
you have a lot of people and a lot of assets and in the face of floods and hurricanes and fires uh, this is what happens so this is all part of the budget we have uh, we can uh, pay our share but we want to make sure the federal government uh, is a good partner and so far i think they've been a very good partner do we have an estimate as to what california's cost would be i don't have an estimate maybe i doubt if you can get one quite this early but it'll be a lot of money what about the california economy you know this is the grape growers this is a huge part of the california economy are we prepared to handle that as well well uh, obviously if fires destroy crops th that won't produce food uh, but I'd say the overall California economy is very large, about 2.5 trillion. And so it grows even in, uh, through disasters and tragedies. Uh, the machinery of the market uh, grinds on. So I, I don't think you're going to see a, a slowdown because of, of the fires. There may be other things going on in the world or the financial world that can affect us. But I think uh, the effort we're putting in, that's stimulative. And then the repairs and the rebuilding, uh, that will also help. Individually, there are, are great tragedies. People have died, uh, people are injured, and their well being and their homes and loved ones are, are deeply affected. So that can't be recovered. Uh, but on a material basis, we will. A question for OES. Uh, when the, somebody is kidnapped, you use the Amber Alert system to notify people. Was a similar system used to notify people of the, the encroaching wildfire that could be evacuation, if not why? Well, actually, there are a number of systems that are get utilized uh, by counties, uh, and they have the redundancy to use those systems when they want to notify the public. One is maybe reverse 911. One is uh, emergency alert system. Um, one is through uh, a, a programs called like it's called Nixel. Uh, these are alert and warning systems. Various counties use different ways to push information out to the public, um, and uh, to my knowledge. Uh, um, they were used by the counties uh, where they could be used, and, and as a part of their protocol, uh, they were implemented in this particular set of fires. What was used? Would they send out the emergency alerts to phones? Because people are saying they didn't get anything. They weren't told through an emergency alert system that they had to evacuate. So, so you, you, these alerts c come out in various forms. They come out over social media. They come out by not notifying your, your phone directly. Um, if it's a reverse 911, they, they have that in a database. If you opt in, you could uh, opt out of those. You would be able to get uh, notifications from the dispatch centers of the, these communities. Um, the idea is that there's multiple ways to be able to notify them. And I, I, mean, I can't speak to who didn't get what they didn't get at the time. Uh, this fire came through the night, was rapidly moving. Some people were uh, awakened while the fire was actually uh, at their doorstep. Um, and um, and uh, in the middle of the night. So I think that the time will tell uh, where we're at on, on, on who got the notifications in the, in the areas so that did. Do didn't. you know if they actually use the text message alert system that, that they have access to? To my knowledge, they use all of the different modalities that they have within their protocols to use. Okay. Follow up yeah. on that, particularly with the cell phone towers going down, are you satisfied as an immediate whether you're satisfied with the way those work or does something more need to be done? Yeah, again, I think it's a little too premature to determine what what actually uh, worked and, and what didn't. I think right now it's been the focus of continuing to, to fight the fire and, um, and, uh, and get the people out of harm's way. You mentioned uh, out-of-state uh, firefighting assets. Uh, could you tell us what percent is? Are they on the road? Are they preparing? Or are they going to get there uh, when they're supposed to get there in, in terms of responding to fire? Absolutely. They're, they're all in various stages of response. Uh, we already have some of those assets in the state and in route and actually assigned to incidents. We have others uh, that are still on the road and will be coming in here today, tomorrow, uh, and the next day, which is what we need because that allows us to plug them into these incidents at the right time and the right places. And so we're very comfortable with that. Every day, the incidents are reevaluating what their needs are, and that allows us uh, to respond to that and get out in front and get them additional resources if they need it. We are at very low containment on most of these, and, but I do want to uh, bring that up because I, I know I committed in, <laughs> over the week to say we would get you some, you know, we, folks are working really hard, uh, you know, and, and a day like yesterday, uh, particularly on the Atlas fire, 
uh, where these fires are just literally uh, burning faster than firefighters can run uh, in some cases. And so imagine being out there in difficult terrain uh, with miles and miles of fire line and to try to catch up to that and put in hand line or lay hose, uh, very challenging. And fires are spotting uh, thousands of feet, miles in some cases ahead. So it's just very difficult uh, to get any kind of containment. But I will tell you, uh, as of this morning on the Atlas fire, uh, we have, they're reporting 3% containment. So that's up from, from zero. Uh, every, every other fire, the nuns uh, are all at about two or 3%. Uh, percent. Uh, very happy uh, to see what's going on on some of the fires uh, in the Sierra, in Nevada and Yuba and Butte County. For example, the Cascade fire uh, in Yuba County at 12,000 acres is 20% contained uh, this morning. Uh, the uh, Laporte fire uh, in Butte County is 15% contained. Uh, fire that was in Calaveras County started at the same time as all of these near West Point is 70% contained. And I can tell you they released 15 fire engines off that fire this morning and are shipping them uh, to these fires and putting them right on the fire line. Uh, the Lakeville fire off Highway 37 uh, there in the Susun Marsh uh, is 70% uh, uh, contained. Uh, the Ridge fire at Indian Valley Reservoir from earlier in the last week is uh, at 75%. Uh, so we are uh, catching up, and I mentioned the Canyon 2 fire uh, in Southern California uh, is uh, at 45% contained, and that fire has essentially been stopped, and we're quickly getting resources off. So we are making progress. Don't let you know, our focus on, obviously, our priority fires, which are the Atlas, the Tubbs, uh, and those fire, other fires in and around Napa, uh, let you believe that we're not actively working on these others. What people don't see every day is we are initially attacking many, many new fires that start that we put out at a small acreage. So these resources are not only fighting the big fires, we are trying to keep every other fire in the state small so it doesn't consume other resources. And so all of this is actively going on and we're having, we're having success across the state. It's just obviously been very small and incremental on these large and challenging fires. Absolutely. So here's been our focus. Uh, we've anticipated this, uh, this wind event coming. Yesterday, the winds shifted to a different direction, the more traditional onshore flow, which pushed them back to the north, uh, back on themselves and, and on the north end of the fire. So while that was happening, we were focusing our efforts on the southern end of these fires, trying to get containment lines in anticipation of the wind change. So now what's happened is these fires are burning back to the south from the north. Uh, and so we can get in there now and anticipate, uh, what, take advantage of what control lines are in. But again, 40 mile an hour winds, 8% humidity, extremely dry fuel beds. Uh, these are going to be very unpredictable fires for the next several days. Um, I want to ask you, you, you've been critical in the past of how the money is budgeted from the federal government for uh, fire prevention efforts. Do you think that contributed at all to the magnitude of what we're seeing? So here's what's important to talk about on, on these fires. Uh, the majority of these fires, the acreage being burned here, are all on uh, state responsibility area lands, almost entirely private landowners, private watershed's. Uh, I know and the question came up about the, is the state budgeted for this? this? This state invested decades ago in wildland fire response, and we have never once been hindered by our ability to gain resources and access resources to fight these fires. The governor has, and the legislature have committed, and that is why the state has been so successful in getting resources and, and doing that. Uh, on the federal side, obviously we have been significant concerns nationally about the, the, the system by which the uh, wildland fire response is funded in the country. When the, the federal agencies, in particular the Forest Service, reaches its funding cap in its base budget, it no longer has the authority to spend outside of that, and they have to start dipping into their other programs like fire prevention. All the work that we do to prevent catastrophic fires like this, to reduce fuel loading, gets impacted because they have to shift that money into uh, fire protection. While that is not directly impacting these fires because these are state responsibility fires, the challenge is, is that we really depend on the federal firefighting resources to come in and help us just like we help them. As I indicated, 170 fire engines you know, are coming uh, from outside the state. Many of those uh, are coming from the federal uh, system. Actually, 154 are coming from the Forest Service from around the country. If they don't have adequate funding to ensure their wildland fire program is fully supported, 
we don't have the ability to reach out to them to get mutual aid and assistance at the same capacity. So, so yes, indirectly, it is critical that we have a strong uh, funding mechanism for our federal partners. Where are we on the cause of the fire? There's just a report that down power line may have sparked some things or other things that may have you know, helped cause this. You know, how did that contribute and kind of what was the fire involved Yeah, I know there's been lots of talk out there about what potential causes are. Understand that all of these fires are under investigation and you know this is nothing new we say this all the time it's literally the truth it's at this point trying to speculate on any cause uh, is premature and also impacts our ability to get uh, to the bottom of the investigation we want to know what the causes are so we can prevent those in the future but at this point it's way too early to talk about it our primary efforts focused on stopping this fire and protecting lives we do however have investigators spread across all of these fires uh, actively working uh, on the, the causes and understanding it's early yet but at this, I'll be honest with you, at this time, I don't have any information uh, on, on any potential uh, of the causes. You know, as we talked about uh, yesterday, uh, you know, in this state, people are related to over 95% of the fires that start. And so it can be really a number of any of those causes. Okay, we're going to take one more question. Question for the Governor Brown or uh, the gentleman representing FEMA. I was at a showcase yesterday, and the, the, the worry or what was the main topic of discussion within the victim there, maybe it's a little premature. They were saying, what resources are they going to obtain uh, from the state level or federal level for those who lost their houses, loved ones, materialistic things, aside from you know, the insurance and things of that nature? Sure. Right now we're out doing assessments to look at uh, exactly what programs the federal government has uh, that will assist individuals with the recovery area. Obviously getting into those areas has been a little bit prob problematic, but uh, we're working with the National Guard to uh, get some um, uh, aircraft up to uh, do some assessments for us uh, with remote piloted uh, vehicles. Uh, and with that information, we'll get a better idea of the requirements to understand exactly what can our programs do of FEMA, uh, what other programs uh, from the federal government will come to play, uh, especially maybe programs from agricultural, uh, maybe uh, tribal programs from, uh, for tribes that may be impacted from BIA, uh, other programs uh, such as Federal Highways, Emergency Road, uh, road Program, uh, and SBA for small interest loans. So we're looking at all those today. Uh, we're primarily focused today on uh, Sonoma and Napa, and we'll get out to other areas when situations warrant that we could do that. But, uh, you know, in, in the meantime, what we're trying to do is help people that are sheltered uh, by providing commodities to those shelters in the interim uh, and, and making sure that they're safe right now where they're at and then focus on those programs. But those will come, and, and those will come soon.